Today, we're going to take a look at noise, electrical noise generated in circuits. What is noise? Characteristics. It's a random signal. It's not correlated. It's not predictable. Right? And that predictability aspect is really important. Non-predictable. Nothing about the past really gives us insight into the future. If I were to look at a sine wave, knowing where it was allows me to determine where it will be in the future. If I know what this frequency is and I know what the peak is, I can tell you what the amplitude is going to be at this instant in time or this instant in time. Whatever. Noise is not like that. Noise is more like this. And all of this stuff tells me nothing about where it's going to be at this instant in time. So this waveform could go like that. It could go like this. It could go like that. Who knows? And it's that, in, that uh, sort of impossible ability to predict what it's going to do that makes it impossible to compensate for. The other thing we know about noise is that it tends to be a broad spectrum. In other words, lots of frequencies all in here together, all mixed around, low frequencies, middle frequencies, high frequencies. The only thing we can really say as far as it being in any way predictable is that we can figure out what its gross power is. So I can see if something has a lot of noise or not much noise. And specifically, the thing that we want to uh, compute is something called signal to noise ratio, which typically we do, we do in decibels. So we'll say the signal to noise ratio is 25 decibels, 80 decibels, 110 decibels, you know, whatever it happens to be. So what are the sources of noise? Well, a really big source is something called Johnson noise or thermal noise. And uh, this is basically just caused by the random motion of electrons. It's um, determined with a little formula. It's 4KTBR, where K is Boltzmann's constant. Uh, 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23rd joules per Kelvin. T is the temperature in Kelvins. B is the noise bandwidth. And R is the resistance in question. Sometimes referred to as noise resistance. So you just take a 1K ohm resistor, that's it. Because it's not sitting at absolute zero, it actually generates a very small noise signal, right? Other kinds of noise, we have things called shot noise, which is sort of the particle nature of current. Flicker noise is also known as one over F noise because it's uh, inversely proportional to frequency. So it's stronger at lower frequencies. Now, if we were going to do a true analysis, we would figure out all of the individual pieces here and kind of stick them together. But in our case, we're going to look at an op amp. Manufacturer has done a lot of the work for us in terms of the internals. It's not like I have a discrete amplifier and I'm trying to figure out all these little pieces. So our goal really is to figure out, you know, how do I determine sort of a gross figure for the noise? What is ultimately the signal to noise ratio? What things do I do to minimize noise? And really to minimize noise, it's best off to remember this equation, which is you would like to keep temperature at a minimum for most practical uh, circuits, certainly commercial residential kinds of things that we would be using. That's not practical. This is the temperature in Kelvins, right? So 
300 degrees Kelvin is a warm room temperature. You're going to have to do something pretty severe to bring down that temperature for your, for your little op amp circuit. Now, if you were talking about uh, a deep space probe that we were trying to receive a signal from, okay, we might be able to do something. Uh, but it's not practical for the most part for your, you know, cell phone. I'm going to super cool my cell phone. No. Um, we can reduce the bandwidth. I don't want the bandwidth to be any more uh, wide than it needs to be. And I also try to minimize resistance. So in a circuit, this goes back to a comment we made a while, a while back. If I just took you know, a little inverting amplifier like this, you know, we had said that it's the ratio of RF and RI that sets the gain. If it's too big of a pair, in other words, if if we choose, you know, one meg in a hundred K instead of, you know, 10 K um, and one K or something like that, even if, even if it's the same ratio, a really large value is going to generate more noise. We've already seen it generates more in the way of offset and drift. So noise is just another nasty thing that happens. So that's what we need to look at practically. Minimize bandwidth, minimize resistance where possible. Interestingly enough, talking about offset and drift, we would add an offset resistor to minimize offset and drift, but that additional resistor will actually increase the noise. How do I have my cake and eat it too? Well, I would probably have to come up with a capacitive bypass around this resistance to minimize the noise resistance and therefore minimize the noise. Okay, there's a couple ways you can approach um, calculating what your signal to noise ratio is. You have to calculate the noise first, then you just compare it against your nominal output voltage. But how do I calculate the noise voltage? First, always remember noise voltage is an RMS value. We can't really talk about a peak. It's not like a sine wave, which is nice and um, you know well controlled and predictable. Now we can say that the ratio between RMS and peak is 0.707, 1.414, whichever way you're going. That's not true with noise. Noise is a really crazy kind of signal. So that ratio between the peak and the RMS we call a crest ratio. So this is a known fixed value. For a noise signal, depending on what the bandwidth is and some other characteristics, the crest ratio might be 10 to 1, 20 to 1, 50 to 1. You know, you have occasional really big spikes in there. Um, you know, that's, that's sort of an unavoidable thing. So we always, we always talk about the RMS value because ultimately that's, you know, what our ears or circuitry are, are going to respond to. So root mean square, we don't talk about peak noise voltage, right? And ultimately that's what we need to do as far as uh, calculating powers and so forth. Now it's possible that the spectrum of noise is not balanced. It's not even. So if I look at the noise power, okay, and this is frequency over here, um, we kind of think of it as being the same everywhere you go. In other words, no matter what the frequency is, it's sort of an equal value. That's referred to as white noise. And it's an allusion to white light. It's all elements of the spectrum. But noise, electrical noise doesn't have to be that way. As a matter of fact, because of this flicker noise, very often an op amp, the noise characteristic will do something like this. You'll have more at the base end, at the bottom end. But it, you know, it can do other things. It can sort of have a constant tilt like that, or like this. It can be kind of lumpy. The spectrum can be, uh, especially in, in specialized circuits, it can be you know, relatively complex. So we're just going to kind of look at a simple, a simple case, sort of a lumped case, and the text there is a more involved process. Um, and if you really need to do a sharper analysis of the noise, I suggest you sort of go that way, look into the op amp text. Um, but for general purpose work, I'm going to show you something that's uh, relatively quick, relatively easy to do. Manufacturer is going to give you a curve, or actually a set of curves that looks something like this. On the vertical axis, we have the input noise voltage. And across on the horizontal, we have the source resistance. And this makes some assumptions. For example, it makes an assumption that you're not using crazy huge um, feedback resistors. 
And then you'll see perhaps a set of curves. You'll see one like this, and then maybe one like that, and then a third one that might look, you know, like that. And what it'll be is uh, a curve of noise voltage for certain bandwidths. So this bottom one might be, I don't know, let's say, might be 100 hertz to like 10 kilohertz or something like that. And then the one in the middle, you know, that might be from uh, somewhat wider, maybe from 50 hertz to uh, you know, 50 kilohertz or something. And then the red one, you know, maybe that's the widest. Maybe that's from like 10 hertz to, you know, 100 kilohertz, right? Simple examples. They'll, you know, vary from manufacturer to manufacturer, part to part. So all you have to do is identify um, a bandwidth that's similar to what you have for your op amp, similar for the application. And there are some little caveats here I'm going to mention in a moment. You identify your source resistance, right? So back here you would have some kind of source resistance. Or if it was an inverting amplifier, RS would be the RI value. In other words, RS, assuming RI is bigger than your source resistance, RS would be this guy, the RI. Um, so you identify that. And then let's say we had the 100 to 10K. You would just come across here, bingo, and you would get your input noise voltage. Of course, you might have a circuit that has a bandwidth that's not here, you know. Maybe you have a circuit that's got a 20 kilohertz F2, you know, using your uh, F unity, your gain bandwidth product, you calculate that's, you know, 20 kilohertz or 25 kilohertz. What do you do? Well, you just sort of estimate, interpolate. In other words, oh, if I if it's 20 kilohertz between the 10 and the 50, you know, maybe that's going to be like here somewhere. So I'll use this. All right, come across, get my value. Now, once I have that EIN, I'm going to multiply that by the noise gain of the amplifier. And remember, noise gain is 1 plus RF over RI. Right? It's a non-correlated signal. This just represents a, a differential input voltage. And it's just multiplied through by the, by the noise gain. So I take that, multiply by the E in noise. That gives me an output noise voltage. So my... V out noise or E out noise, whatever you want to call it. Again, an RMS value is equal to that noise gain times this value from the chart, right from my graph. Now my signal to noise ratio is simply going to be that value, right, the V out noise, divided into, oops, that was a little sloppy of me. I don't have room. Let's try that again. So it's the V out noise divided into your output nominal signal. In other words, your typical, your expected average output signal. Again, is an RMS. Make sure these things are RMS values. So very quickly, um, if I have a circuit over here and, um, you know, I, I have this like, uh, I'll, I'm going to use the black one, the 100 to 10K, and this thing comes out to be, I don't know, let's, let's say it's like uh, uh, 10 microvolts RMS. And maybe my circuit has a gain of 10. So I would say my signal to noise ratio would be 10 times the 10 microvolts. And maybe my nominal output would be, oh, I did it again. Here, we'll do this. Uh, let's say the nominal output's one volt RMS. Okay, so I've got one volt RMS divided by 100 microvolts. Well, that's a factor of 10,000, right? RMS over RMS. And I would express that in decibels, right? This would be SN, SN prime, would just be, because it's a voltage ratio, 20 log base 10, 
of this 10,000. And that's 10 to the fourth. So that's uh, 20 dB per factor of 10. So that's 80 dB. All right, so your, your nominal signal is 80 decibels above your noise floor. Okay, now a couple interesting little things here. Put this in perspective for human hearing. Um, if you were to look at, let's say, maybe uh, an old-fashioned, how's this, how's this for going back? An old-fashioned cassette player. You might be looking at maybe 50 dB from the loud bits down to the hiss of the tape, right? When you just play the tape, you just get this hiss from the tape. 50 dB. An old-style vinyl album, not counting the, the clicks and the pops, right? Just the surface noise that you would get might be 60, 65. Okay, a little better. Theoretical maximum for a CD is about 97 decibels. Now, if you think about that for a sec, if you were to play your stereo, right, car stereo, home stereo, whatever, you crank it up, and you get it to a really, really loud level, right, like maybe 110 dB SPL, and that, I mean, that's concert level. And, you, and first of all, it's going to be hard to get your stereo to do that, but assuming, it, assuming you could. And you were, you were playing this CD, and it was at its theoretical maximum, which, you know, it, it might not be, but let's just be nice about it. At 97, then what you're saying is that the noise floor on the CD as a sound pressure level in the room is only 13 dB SPL. Now, I will guarantee you that unless you live in a, you know, inside the recording booth of a, of a, a studio or something like that, the ambient noise in your house is way higher than 13 dB SPL. So in a case like that, you know, this, this CD, this, this music source, is effectively noise-free. It's buried in the, what the ambient noise is. Okay? The other thing is an issue with this whole bandwidth issue. In other words, we are talking about reducing noise by reducing uh, resistance and reducing bandwidth. There are instances when the circuit bandwidth and what I'll call the target bandwidth are different. So I could make an amplifier with my op amp that I'm going to use, you know, for my stereo. And that thing might have a 50 kilohertz F2. So I do my calculations, like I'd use this purple curve here for 50 kilohertz, and I'd come up with my number. That wouldn't necessarily correlate super tight with what I hear. Why? Because if I have an F2 that's 50 kilohertz, and I'm just going to reuse this diagram, and I'm just going to say 50K is over here. As a human being, I can't hear that high. Young, healthy human beings with you know, undamaged hearing, their upper limit is around 20 kilohertz. So you can only hear up to here. But if you have a measurement device, right? you got a meter and you're going to, a wideband RMS voltmeter, and you're going to measure this noise voltage, that includes all this noise in here. So you're actually going to get a higher number than what you perceive as a human being. This is over an octave. There's like an extra octave of, of noise that's going to be added in. So if I uh, measure this for my amplifier, then an amplifier that has an extra wide bandwidth comes out sort of um, disadvantaged because it's going to report a higher number for its signal-to-noise ratio. So what we do is we, we use some kind of filter. A, 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 what's called a weighting filter. I'm going to put a um, weight, so to speak, so to, so to speak, on the spectrum. So if I can only hear up to 20 kilohertz, then why don't I put a little band limiting filter on here that does something like this? In other words, it won't pass any signals above 20 kilohertz, and on the bottom end, 
can hear down to about 20 hertz. Appropriately, this is red. Spectrally, that makes sense. Um, so I only allow through the signals that I can hear. And I measure that. Now I can measure two, three, four, five amplifiers that all have different values for F2, but the way they're going to sound to me will be on an even keel, right, by using that filter. So sometimes you'll see for like SPL readings, you'll see something called DBA. What that is, is DBSPL with an A-weighted filter. And an A-weighted filter is a very specific shape, and it's really designed for uh, like voice communication. So maybe if you were using you know, like a telephone kind of thing, measurement, that might be appropriate. For something like your stereo, it's a much wider spectrum. And we would use a different kind of filter, like maybe a C-weighted filter, which would look more like this red thing that I've drawn here, much broader sort of spectrum. And that's how we would do an appropriate correlation. Um, now your dog, you know, if you have a dog, could probably hear up to about 40 kilohertz. So, you know, your dog might listen to this stereo and say, you know, it sounds a little hissy to me. It's got a little bit extra noise. I think you've got to buy a new amplifier. You know, um, okay, well, if your dog can do that, hey, all the power to you. But um, I don't think most people are going to buy stereos based on what their, what their dog is uh, saying or how, how it's reacting to the noise level. Um, although, you know, who knows? Who knows in the future? You know, we might come across an a extraterrestrial um, civilization, you know, completely different evolutionary path, and maybe those creatures, those intelligent uh, people, can hear up to 100 kilohertz, you know, and they're going to come down and they're going to listen to our music and say, wow, these people have terrible taste in audio equipment, just noisy, Blech. you know, and then you go to their planet and you listen to theirs and it's like, eh, it doesn't sound any better than ours, you know, different spectrums. Okay, nice little diversion there, but that's your technique, right? So like I said, if you have a different spectrum, you know, if your upper limit, if your F2 is a little bit different, just estimate what that's going to be if it doesn't fall right on one of these. But you get your value, multiply out by your gain. You know, we already talked about the noise gain. Take the ratio, express it in decibels, and you've got your signal-to-noise ratio. Okay? All right. Next time.